Well, I didn't bring a box this morning, but I brought something else. Does anyone know what I call this? It's not a horse. It's not a horse. What? A cooler, yes. That's your music. What would you call this? This is my lunch box. And when I go off to work, I fill this full with food. And I eat it all, every day. But this morning, I brought something in here that I think you will probably never, ever guess. So I'm not even going to ask you to guess what it is. There, you won't guess. Here it is. Ta-da! You were going to guess ice cubes? Oh, shoot, I should have had you guess. Well, listen. I brought this ice along because, does anyone know what ice really is? <clears throat> what is ice? Very good, it's really cold water. And when ice, when water gets cold as this, it just turns to ice, doesn't it? And did you know that in the Bible, God says that our hearts can sometimes get so cold, it's almost like they turn to ice. Is that a good thing? No, it's not at all a good thing. Because when our hearts are cold and icy, we can't love very much, can we? But do you know why our hearts get cold and icy like this? It's because of sin. When you're angry with your brother, how many have brothers and sisters here? Some of you, do you ever get angry with your brother or sister? Yes, okay. Right now you are, okay. When you allow that anger to stay in your heart, it can turn your heart cold. Sometimes you don't even want to love them again. That's not a good thing, is it? Because we're supposed to love our brothers and sisters. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning, about how our hearts can get so cold that we need other people to remind us, to warn us, to help us to turn again and to love people that God calls us to love. So remember, when you look at an ice cube, remind yourself, don't ever, ever let your heart get that cold. Because that's not a good thing. Okay? Now what else are we supposed to do? Oh! <laughs> so help yourself to a piece of candy. And then those of you who are able service lasts an extra 15 minutes because of this argument. I, I would like to uh, <clears throat> have you uh, think with me again this morning about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I said last week that what we want to do once again is to become amazed and awestruck and even flabbergasted at what Jesus says concerning these words in the Sermon on the Mount, because at the end of chapter 7, it says exactly that. that those who heard Jesus were amazed at his teaching. And that amazement was something that wasn't just for a little bit, but the, the word is such that every time they thought about it, they got even more amazed, because it wasn't that the words were so hard to understand, but because they're so hard to do. And yet they're so important to be done. So, this is what we're going to talk about this morning. So we're going to begin uh, with chapter 5, and uh, beginning at verse 21, and then we will uh, read through verse 24, and then I'll read her back to you. Here it is, verse 21. <coughs> you have heard that it was said... Could you turn me down a bit? I feel like I'm really not going to You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Rekha, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go first and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now turn down to verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? 
be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect. And then we go to verse 1 of chapter 7. <clears throat> Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet, and then turn and tear you to pieces. And this is the word of God. Would you bow with me in a short prayer? Lord, we want these words to become our words. The way we live our lives as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so will you guide us into this truth? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I hope that you understood, you saw it as we read through the scripture this morning that the word brother and brothers is repeated over and over again. I've counted seven times in the text that we read this morning that Jesus uses that word. And in the newer versions, of course, they will say brothers and sisters, and that's correct. Brothers and sisters. Family members. Because you see, when you become a Christian, you get a family. And sometimes the family that we get isn't always the family that we would like. There are, there are no options to this, you see. The family you get might not be the family you like. I was raised with a, an older brother and a younger sister. My younger sister and I got along really well. She was five years younger than I, and, and uh, that worked out pretty good. I could boss her around, she obeyed. My, my older brother was two years older than I, and, and he had the ability to make everything come out his way. No matter what contest we were in, and we were always running contests, he could ride his old bicycle faster than I could, he could hit the ball farther than I could, he could do everything better than I could, even though I could almost prove that I beat him at something, he would make up some excuse as to why he was still better than I was. And I was so frustrated with my brother, I remember one, no, I won't tell that story. I, <laughs> some things are better left unsaid than a mixed company like this. But I remember going to my mother and saying to her, Mom, why does he have to be in this family? And she said to me, listen, if you want to be in this family, then you have to accept the fact that you also have a brother and a sister. If you want a mom and a dad, in this family, you also get a brother and sister. And she was right. <laughs> Absolutely right. Now, I have to say that there came a point in time where we reconciled, my brother and I, and we're great friends now. He finally, he finally grew up and admitted that, you know, he was not better than I was. So, so we gotten along just wonderful after that. But, but growing up, you see, there was this, this tension that was going on between us. He had the upper hand. And I resented that fiercely. What God is saying in His Word is exactly the same thing, I believe. That when you have been adopted into the family of God, when Jesus Christ becomes your Savior and Lord, you also get brothers and sisters, family members, people who have also, just like you, been adopted into the family by grace. And these people may not be like you. As a matter of fact, you might not even like them so much because you disagree on certain things. But Jesus says, never mind that. You have to love your brother and sister. This is the essence of what it means to be, to live as a Christian in community, brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I understand how important that is for us. And so in this new community, the family of God, we're going to try to understand the importance of it. So four things I want to show you. First of all, 
the nature of this community, the importance of it, and the intensity of these relationships, and then the loving and truthful quality of this particular community. Those four things. So first of all, then, the nature of it. The family of God being restored into the community of God's family. And in this family, we have to accept the fact that we are not all alike. Now, this family is different than belonging to, say, a country club. In a country club, I have people who I might play golf with or play tennis with, but I have very little else in common with them. They just play tennis with me or play golf. And I really don't care so much about them as people. They're just my golf partners. But in the community of God, in the relationship that we're talking about here, it's, it's a family. And in the family, I have to be concerned about how this relationship is ongoing. So when this relationship is fractured, when this relationship is somehow broken, I must, I must be concerned about that need and offer my assistance in some way. That's the very nature of this community. Secondly, there is the importance of it. Now there are three things, I can think of many more, but I'll just point three reasons why I think this is so important. The community of God of which you are a part, or thinking of becoming a part, is important because you need each other to understand God. I've been a Christian most of my life. And I've been, well, never mind. I, I have studied the scriptures and I, I've learned a lot, but I suspect that I know maybe two or three percent what it means to know God. Just a minuscule amount. But I do know this, that you also have knowledge of God. You have a certain amount of information, some experiences, some, some ways that you have seen God at work in your life. And you have maybe a 2 or 3 percent or a 4 percent experience of God that I should be learning from, you see. And so when we sit together in community as a family around the table of fellowship and we talk about who God is to us, we have this wonderful experience of saying, you know, I never thought about that. The way you just put it has helped me understand God a little better. And so we have this wonderful ability to encourage one another in our growth in fellowship with God. Some of us pray differently than others. And some of us worship differently. And that's all good, you see, because I don't look at you and you shouldn't look at me when I pray or when I sing a song as, as being odd or strange. No, I'm experiencing God differently than you do. But praise God for that, you see. In the, in the eternal realm of things, we all have so much to learn regarding who God is and how to experience it. The second reason why it's important that we be a family together, the importance of it, is this. That in the family of God, I can only experience God's spiritual gifting in relationship with other church family members. Peter talks about this. In 1 Peter, he talks about the fact that we are stones being joined together into the household of God. We're connected to Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone, and these stones are being put together, and this becomes the house of God in which God's Spirit dwells. Now, that's, that's deep theology, I understand, but it means this, really. It means that when, when I individually walk around with my one or two gifts, and I don't use that, those gifts in relationship to my brothers and sisters. I don't really experience God's power at all. I don't really have the ability to experience how good it is to be able to serve another person, to love another person. And you have the same experience. If you're not using your gifts to gather in community as brothers and sisters in Christ, you're not experiencing the fullness of what God has for us. The third reason is this, that when Jesus was going to the cross, in John chapter 17, he made this final prayer, and his prayer was this, Father, make them one. Even as you and I are one, Father, make them one so that they would love each other the way we love one another in the Trinity. This is to God's glory, you see. 
So when there are people who will say, you know, I don't mind being a Christian. I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to go to church. I don't want to monkey with all of this messy stuff that happens in people's lives. I just, I just want to be alone with my Bible and with Jesus and maybe the TV evangelist, you see. And there are a lot of people out there who are saying that these days. They're checking out of churches because they don't want the mess of family. And the Bible is saying that is just not the way it works. Your faith, your commitment to Christ, and I'll show you this a little while later, your commitment to Christ is going to be directly impacted by the relationships that you have with your brothers and sisters in Christ here in this room, in this community, and around the world. It is essential that we understand this as part of our, of our relationship with Christ. Third, there is the intensity of this new community. The intensity of it. This is an intense relationship. It's not something that is to be just sort of glanced over and ignored. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 18 talks about that intensity in one level. It says there in Matthew chapter 18 that if, you, if your brother sins against you, what are you supposed to do? Go to him. Or go to her, it's her sister, and, and, and try to reconcile things. And show them their fault, Jesus says. And if, and if they won't hear, then you've regained your brother, your sister. And if not, then, then you take another person with you. You know how that goes. Read Matthew 18 for that. But here in Matthew chapter 5, there is even stronger words. Jesus raises the bar even farther. Because he's saying here in chapter 5 that when you're going to worship and you're bringing your gift to the altar, you're coming to worship here, and you notice that someone that you have recognized, someone that you have known, your brother, your sister, is not here with you. Jesus says, and here's what you have to do. You leave your gift and you go find your brother. Now notice what Jesus is not saying here. Number one, Jesus is not saying, if your brother has offended you, you're not angry with your brother or sister. And neither is Jesus saying, if, if this person, if you have offended that person, and you know that you have done something to hurt that person's feelings. He doesn't even say that. He just says, you know that there's something wrong between you and that person, or between that person and the rest of the family of God. Now this is radical, you see, because we would quickly say, well, hey, that's their problem, isn't it? If they're upset about something, who cares? Let them stew it out. They'll get over it, and they'll come back to church someday. That's what we do with people at the, down at the club, you see. If they're upset because we, we whoop them in tennis uh, and uh, they don't come back the next week, hey, no problem. That's not our problem. But in the church, among God's people, it is an issue. So Jesus says, if you know that your brother or sister is not coming to worship or not coming to Bible study or not associating with you in the, in the fellowship of Christianity, and you know the reason why, go to you. Now we would say, well, that person ought to come to us. Well, yeah, should they? But they're they're too afraid. They're they're too they're too nervous about this approach business, and so they won't come. And so Jesus says, go to them. Now listen to this. This is what I was talking about with the kids. When we get to the text of Hebrews chapter three, verse thirteen. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Encourage one another daily, as long as it is today, so that none of your hearts may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see, all of us are in danger of having our hearts hardened by sin. And it's deceitfulness. Lies. And so we're called to go and encourage one another daily so that this doesn't happen. You see, I was raised on the farm, and, and in the wintertime, on the really coldest of days, 
we would have to go out sometimes several times a day and knock the ice off the stock tank. You know, make sure that the uh, the tank was open so the cows and animals could drink from the stock tank. If we let it freeze over, it was of no value to the animals. Now this was a miserable task because it was always cold out there. But you see, it's the same way. If we don't if we don't deal with the hardness that is happening in our lives because of sin, it's going to harden our hearts. And it's going to turn us into bitter, cold, angry people. And God knows there's enough of those in the world. And you see, what Jesus is saying here is that it's important, it's necessary for those who are brothers and sisters to be concerned about that person who isn't showing up anymore at the meetings, who doesn't come any longer to worship, who isn't involved anymore in our little circle of, fa of family and community. And, and so we have to go to them and address that issue daily, if necessary, so that their hearts will not grow hardened. And this is God's command for us. Do they deserve it? Well, no, it's their problem, it's their fault. But we care for them, we love them, we're so concerned about them that we will speak the truth in love for them. And that leads us to the final point that I want to make, and that is the gentle but truthful nature of this relationship in the community of God. The gentle but truthful nature, speaking the truth in love. Uh, some of us are really good at the truth. Oh, we love the truth. You know? and, and we can take that truth and, and load up on it and, and almost uh, just joyfully, gleefully get it in somebody's face and tell them what's true. And I know some people who are really, really good at truth. Then there are people on the opposite extreme who are really good at love. They just, they hate confrontation. I'm, I'm, that, I'm that person by nature. I hate confrontation. I would do anything to get out of the fight. You know, I made it the world's worst soldier because <laughs> uh, I didn't want to fight. But the, the truth is, you see, uh, each of us both are either one or the other by nature. We either come with the harsh truth or we come with love. Love that is so soft and so tender that the people who are trying to get the truth to don't even see it. They don't even understand it. It doesn't make sense. What are you trying to say? I just, no, you're, you're, you're a good person. You're okay. Never mind, you know. Truth and love. But the Bible describes this relationship as necessarily bringing the truth and love together. And speaking the truth in love, we build one another up into Christ. Now, here, here's the thing, you see. Jesus concludes this teaching on uh, the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 7. We're talking about uh, the splinter in your brother's eye and the big big board or moat or log or whatever is in your eye. Obviously that's an exaggeration. But you understand what he's saying. If you got if you got this, this huge eye problem in your own life and you're trying with a little tweezers to get the, the splinter out of your brother's eye, your neighbor's eye, that isn't going to work. And the same is true for, for sin and for and confronting your neighbor with the truth. If you have a huge glaring issue in your own life and you're coming to your neighbor and you say, well, listen, let me tell you what's wrong with your, your life. What's wrong in your family? What's wrong with your kid? It's just not going to work. So Jesus is saying, you know, repent of the thing that's in your own life first. And do that in front of your brother, your sister, so that you can then address the real issue that's happening in the relationship with that brother and sister. And then there's this word that comes at the very end of the text we read where Jesus is saying, don't, don't give your <clears throat> the dogs what is sacred and don't throw your pearls to pigs. Now I know there have been people who have anguished over those words of Jesus and they've written volumes and preached sermon after sermon. What in the world is Jesus talking about here? Don't, don't give sacred things to dogs and don't throw pearls to pigs. And a lot of people have interpreted this to mean, well, this, this has to do with evangelism. This has to do with, with speaking to people who don't want to hear the message. And so when you hear them, uh, when they slam the door in your face, then you just say, well, I'll just not throw my pearls in front of those pigs. And you walk away. They don't want to hear it, so don't pay attention to them. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about evangelism here. 
Everything that Jesus is talking about here in this text has to do with the relationship between brothers and sisters in Christ. And so he's saying to us, he's saying to you this morning, don't give sacred things to the dogs. What? Try it this way. Try it. See if it fits in your way of thinking. The sacred things that Jesus is talking about here could be the things which are spoken in such love. They're the soft things, the things that, that you're trying to say to them, that, that are trying to encourage them. But it's got to have truth to it. But the truth is so hard to get into it that they don't understand it. And, and so they'll swallow it all up, but they won't, they won't value it. My kids have a, or had a big old, um, big old lab dog, yellow lab. And uh, one day, uh, this lab was seen uh, with his paws on the countertop, and he had grabbed, guess what? He had grabbed the steak off the, the, off the countertop, and in three gulps had swallowed that whole steak, just devoured it. And, and that's how I envision this, this section here, this little sentence. You, you give your sacred things to dogs, but they don't appreciate it. They just gobble it up and say, ah, I don't know what that was about. See, they missed it. The flip side of it is that when you come with harsh truth that is so hard and so cutting that they won't even bite into it. That's like throwing pearls to pigs. Because you can throw rocks to pigs but they'll sniff at it, and I can guarantee you they won't eat it because it's, it's too hard to chew, you see. It, they can't digest it. So they, they refuse it. And because they're still hungry, Jesus is saying, they might turn and attack you as a person. So here it is, you see. We have this awesome responsibility to speak the truth in love and to come with love with the truth because without truth, there is no love. And we do this so that we build each other up and build up our brother and sister who is, who is somehow being struck with, with every forms of evil that turns their hearts cold and bitter toward God and other people. And because they are our brother and sister in Christ, we are duty bound to care for them that way. And when the people listened to what Jesus was saying, they thought about their own relationships, as I hope you're sitting here thinking, mm -hmm. with whom should I be concerned right now? The more they thought about it, the more awestruck they were. <coughs> and they say, this is so hard. How can we do this? And Jesus would say, with God's Spirit helping you, it can be done. So take the steps, take the risk, so to speak. Speaking truth and love to your brother and sister who needs to just be brought back into fellowship. Helping them repent of their sins as you have repented of yours before them. And allow them to once again know the joy, the beauty of belonging to the family. Then God will be honored. This church will be blessed in the world too. Father, we thank you today for the gift of salvation. We know, Lord, that you have saved us, not just so that we might be saved, but so that we might, along with all the brothers and sisters around the world, from every race and nationality and color, and every cultural background and every strange foible, they might also be brought into this circle of love. Not just to be held at an arm's distance, but to be loved deeply and sincerely. Loved with a love that, that really cares enough about them to enter into their struggles. And speak the truth in love. And yet love them truthfully. Oh God, we pray that you will bless this word to our hearts. And we know, Father, that there are people, even right now, as we sit here, whom you are bringing to our minds that... We probably shouldn't go to them. We probably shouldn't care enough about their situation so that we would touch their lives. 
and hopefully turn their hearts from cold to warm to passionately in love with you again. <coughs> Guide us, we pray, to the truth ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.